Okay, you can turn in your King James Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to do a, a kind of a unique study. Kind of goes without saying, um, if you're familiar with the ministry here. Uh, but I want to do a unique study on should a Christian care about the environment. Now, I was originally going to call this study, should a Christian be an environmentalist? But I don't want to get, you know, lumped in with Greenpeace and with all the different kind of environmental preservationist groups. Um, some of those things that they stand up for is good on the surface, some of the things that they stand up for, but then they get too far with it into the preservation where nobody's allowed to touch it, which is kind of funny because here in the local area of Patton, Maine, over to our uh, west, there's the National Monument, uh, which a number of years ago they voted here in northern Maine to basically make a big park over that way into a national monument and sort of a you know hands off whatever else and the funny thing is while people are thinking wow it's a part of northern maine that's been preserved uh no actually they've been log raping it like crazy over the last year so you see all these big trucks coming out with just huge piles of logs so um oh we can trust the government we'll make it a bio reserve or whatever else yeah then the government says okay nobody's looking let's go in there and just rape the living daylights out of that area uh it's a funny joke. So you can't say, I want to be an environmentalist and just preserve the land and nobody can touch it because somebody's going to touch it. Some government entity is going to come in there or big business or whatever else, military industrial complex, which we'll be talking about in this study. They come in and they'll say, hey, you know, uh, we kind of need to, you know, there's some really good resources in here. There's some good money. Since nobody's allowed in here, let's just use this. That's why I'm against the whole environmental preservation type of a thing, because it's just hypocritical. Kick people off the land, and then there's nobody there to defend the land, protect the land that God has rightfully entrusted man to take care of. All right? But let's look about this study here. What should our position be towards God's creation, the earth that he made? What should we do with it? Second Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, here's the point of this me reading this to get into context, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Stop right there. So, hey brother, it doesn't matter what happens to the earth because it's all going to burn right? Eh, you're on shaky ground there. Well, see, you go back before the flood, the days of Noah. Well, who cares what we do to the earth? Go and mess things up and whatever else that, you know, yeah, God has a way that trees grow and that animals need certain habitats and environments and whatever else. And there's clean air and things that you can do to pollute the water. You'd go over and you put sewage into a, a spring or something like that. Well, that's a problem. Well, it doesn't matter. It's all going to be destroyed by a flood, they could have said. And it'll all get washed away and destroyed anyhow. See? Then after the, the flood in the days of Noah, from then till now, till it was revealed to Peter there in, that, in this epistle, um, you know, when that is revealed, I should say, um, hey, everything's going to burn, so who cares? See, you see what I'm saying? I, hopefully you can see where I'm going with this whole thing. You know, you could make the argument if God's going to burn the earth, then it really doesn't matter what we do to the earth. If I change the oil in my truck and I feel like dumping it into the woods someplace, there's an old creek there that I don't care anything about. I'll just go and dump the oil in there and let it run down the river. Well, who cares? Hey, there's a, they've discovered some natural gas on my property here, so I'm just going to let them frack the area here and then they can get the natural gas out and... Yeah, there's pollutants going out into the atmosphere and eh, whatever, I get money from it. You know, well, hey, they can put a 5G tower on my property because, you know, hey, I get paid a, 
you know, certain amount for having it there. And, you know, it puts off some electrical fields and I find dead birds around the thing occasionally. But, eh, you know, you see what I'm saying? It's all going to burn. It doesn't matter. So you can think of it that way or you can think of it, what does the Bible actually say about our responsibilities to God's creation? Obviously, this world is not our home. That's another thing there. Um, we have no permanent dwelling here on this earth. All right? We're pilgrims. We're passing through. So then do we just treat God's creation terribly? I would say no to that. And I'm going to give you the proof of that as we continue. But let's continue reading here. <clears throat> Verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a, as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Okay? So, yes, this world is going to burn. All right, to say I'm going to make some kind of a special permanent monument here, the Baxter State Park, which is to the west of the National Monument. Um, there was a governor that we had here in Maine, not, you know, I say we because I'm, I'm a citizen of Maine now, but, you know, the state of Maine, I wasn't born in Maine. And I st certainly wasn't around when uh, Governor Baxter was here in, in this area, but he came up and he said, I want to preserve this beautiful area with Mount Katahdin, the biggest mountain in Maine, which is just to the west of us. It's just about a mile tall, a little over 5,000 feet above sea level. And it's the start of the Appalachian Trail, breathtaking, just absolutely beautiful. And he went back in there and he said, I want to preserve this. So he, I guess, through whatever means, he bought this whole area and he put it into a trust. So there's no possible way it can be sold or no future person can come along and say, I, uh, you know, actually, I need the money, so I want to get rid of the you know, park here that my great, great, great grandfather had or something, which I don't think Governor Baxter had children, so that wouldn't work either, but some relative or whatever. No, it's in a trust. Well, can we do that with certain things on the earth? Well, eventually Baxter State Park is going to burn up. Time of Jacob's Trouble shows up, a third of all the trees are burned up and all green grass is burned up. I've been back there. I've been picking, you know, they have low bush uh, blueberries back in Baxter State Park. And I was back there picking them. Um, so all that is going to be burned up. A lot of the trees, the big beautiful trees back in Baxter State Park, they'll be burned up, a third of them, according to the scriptures. Um, and I mean, he cared so much about it that he wouldn't even take his dogs back in to Baxter State Park. And today, this, to this very day, you can't take pets with you if you go back to Baxter State Park. No dogs, no cats, no anything. So pretty interesting. But we know that the Bible is teaching that everything's going to be burned up. So again, you can use that to say that it doesn't matter what we do to the earth because it's all going to burn anyhow. All right? That's not what the scripture is saying here. Let's continue. You'll see what I'm talking about. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved in the earth, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So there's no justification. In other words, if somebody would turn here and say, the earth is going to burn up, so who cares? That's not why it's talking about the earth being burned up. It's just simply saying we're not to set our affections on things here on this earth. So don't make a special park or a special thing and whatever else that will be preserved forever. No, don't do that. But it doesn't give you the right to just say, okay, I'll just trash the earth. I'll trash my property and do a bunch of toxic stuff to this property. You're not given the right to do that. Okay? We're not supposed to love this world so much that it takes our eyes off of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to remember that this is temporary down here. But here's another point to think about. <clears throat> as we read up there um, in verse 8, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. What's that referring to? It's referring to God's timeline. 
Earth, the Earth has been around for approximately 6,000 years. Not quite 6,000 years yet. But the 7,000th year, that day, the seventh day there, is when God rests. It's when the Earth will rest. God's going to come back and he's going to rule and reign on the Earth physically for 1,000 years. And it's going to be an amazing time. Now, if God's going to come back and have a perfect time of peace on the Earth, then I think he might care a little bit about the quality of things on the earth here, the um, us taking care of the earth. I mean, there'd be no point in him. I mean, if you just say, yeah, the earth's going to burn up, uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, you, you know, you want to throw a bunch of waste out and whatever else. And I mean, the, one of the things that irritates me so much is you get city people that come out to the country and they think that the country is this magical land of, you know, where you can throw your trash and it just disappears somehow magically. You know, and people will throw trash on our property. We get, I literally am standing here right now looking out through the side window out through the sun porch on our office here. And I can see, I just saw a piece of trash flying through our yard, you know, like a tumbleweed. You know, why? Because some slob walking by on the sidewalk just chucked their trash into our yard. You know, all the time, I, whenever I mow the yard, which is not very much because I hate mowing yards, but whenever I mow the yard out here, Candy wrappers, junk food, cigarette butts, all kinds of stuff that cans of people throw cans of beer and things, you know, ha, 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 the ministry stuff here, Bible verses, I'll throw a can of beer out in the guy's yard or whatever else. We've had that, I don't know how many times, up on our property as well. People throwing cans of beer and, and stuff back onto our property. Just disgusting. Uh, people go out to natural areas. It's not just they pick on us, they go out to natural areas and, you know, around here and there's a beautiful hiking trail and they just drinking beer and they throw their, you know, bottle down and oh, there's a rock. Let's see if I can hit it. Smash and there's broken glass everywhere there. Is God okay with that? Well, Eric's going to burn, brother. It doesn't matter. Uh, yes, it does matter. It does matter very much. I believe my stand that I take is while I'm not a preservationist, while I'm not saying you shouldn't log, you shouldn't cut a tree down because you could it could fall down on a salamander's toe or something like that. Uh, I'm not that far into the spectrum of being an environmental preservationist. I don't believe in that. But what I am saying is there are certain things we should do to take care of what God has created to show proper respect for his creation, to be stewards of the land, to, to, be, to care for it. And I'm looking forward to the millennial kingdom when we're going to be living here on the earth for a thousand years with Jesus Christ, ruling and reigning with Christ, if you suffer with him. Hopefully you have suffered as a Christian. If you don't ever suffer as a Christian, you better get saved. I'll just say it that way, especially nowadays. But I'm looking forward to that thousand year kingdom when we can be here on the earth with the Lord. It's going to be a wonderful time when we actually get along with the wild animals and they get along with us and the curse is, is basically removed and people are living, you know, basically the whole time. I mean, it's going to be an amazing thing, this kingdom that's coming. So if the Lord's going to set that up on the earth, then I think he cares about the quality of the earth, the, the us keeping, taking care of things and not just being, no, eh, whatever, you know. Um, a big thing that's going on right now, which I've been talking about, is this thing of Wolfton. Um, it's a mining company from Canada. And uh, there's a lot of these Canadian companies, by the way, that are owned by China now. So communist China could be behind Wolfton. And they want to come into this area and mine a mountain, Pickett Mountain, to the north of us. Uh, absolutely insane. All the pure waters of northern Maine, um, they're really clean water up here. We, you know, have spring water on our property. Um, it's great. Well, these idiots are going to come up here, these devils, servants of the devil, and they want to mine the place which could, you know, they're going to be injecting arsenic as long, along with a bunch of other chemicals into the ground to try to get the metals out. Well, that's the modern mining practice. It's absolutely vile and disgusting. Oh, but don't worry, we won't get it into the groundwater and it, it won't get into the aquifer. And if it does, we'll try to clean it up. And never. It's never happened before. There's never a mine that hasn't produced some kind of pollution. All mines produce pollution. But see, they want to come here and they want to destroy what God created. And they eventually want to be able to do an open pit mine. The only people who do that are, you know, China, as far as I'm aware. You know, open pit mining is a terrible thing. Talk about toxicity and everything else. 
you're just basically destroying a whole mountain is what they're doing. And then you have to have a tailings facility where you take the poison, you know, sludge that comes from mining and you stick it in the tailings facility and then it's kind of, you don't go over and, you know, get in that water over there. It's very poisonous. Well, how long will it be poisonous? Well, you know, pretty much indefinitely. <laughs> Insane. And all for what? For money. But see, I guess if I looked at the Bible and twisted 2 Peter chapter 3, I could say, well, the earth's going to burn up, so who cares, man? Hey, if there's good money in it, who cares? Psalm 8. I'll turn to Psalm 8. And I've literally known professing Christians that have had that exact thought process, or I could say philosophy because it spoiled them, they've had this philosophy of the earth is going to burn up. Man, it doesn't matter. I'm just a pilgrim. I'm passing through. Who cares? They want to put a cell tower on my land. They want to frack my property. Hey, man, is there, is there money in it? How much money are we talking about? Okay, good money. Go ahead and do it. It's not supposed to be that way. Psalm 8 Verses 3 through 9. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Dominion. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. Um, I read verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. What did we learn here from that passage? You look at nature, you look at what God created, and you say, I have dominion over this. I have to be here to protect this. I look at my property, and I look and I say, boy, they did a terrible job logging this. Uh, and they did. The guys that log, logged my property did an absolutely awful job. I mean, talk about cut and run logging. I mean, these guys are just raped the, the property. And just there's a, so many areas that the, the trees need to be thinned out. They're just the the new growth that came in, you know, as a result of them logging, they, they did not do any kind of a um, selective cut logging, which is what I would have done, where I, you take some of the bigger trees or if there's some cold trees, you take those down for whatever other purposes for selling for firewood or whatever but you the idea is to make the healthy or the the forest healthier um, the property where i grew up in pennsylvania they did selective cut logging in 1978 i was born in 1975 1978 my parents bought the property behind the house where i was born and they had it logged and it was a good logging company um, they came in they logged it a selective cut, cutting the big trees, leaving the trees that were there to, that were big enough that they could have probably taken to a mill and gotten something out of it. But they said, no, we'll leave those trees there and then they can grow and replenish the forest and the timber stand here and, and whatnot. And you could actually see many years later in about year 2000, I logged the property. So from 1978 to the year 2000, those trees had time to grow. And I mean, I was felling trees that were, you know, three feet or so in diameter, you know, tulip poplars and black oaks, red oaks, uh, some really good high value timber on the property. And, you know, 70, 80 feet tall. I mean, they were giant trees. And I'd cut, I felled this one tree and it was so weird because I was looking at the growth rings on the stump and you could go back and you could see in 1978 when they did the logging, you could see the very next year, the growth rings were huge. And then they got smaller and smaller and smaller till back to the way that they used to be before then. But you could plainly see that logging, selective cut logging, actually was good for the forest. It actually did a good thing. So again, I'm not saying environmental preservationism, you know, you don't cut down trees. Trees are the connection between Father Sky and Mother Earth or something. No, no. Cut trees down, but do it in a responsible manner. Go through and log responsibly. Don't send in huge big machinery that just ruts out the land and smashes the land down and compacts it and then it's just ruined. And you know, our property that we have, a lot of the trees that were left behind, 
they they were barked on one side just you know, the skidders just yanking logs past and just slamming into the trees trees are like this and they're they're just skidding past you know hitting the tree with logs and and all the barks ripped off on the sides of the trees that face the skid roads that where they were skidding everything out and those trees are now dying it was logged in 2014 it's 2022 right now so they did a terrible job well now i have been given dominion over that land it's now my property so now I have to go through and I have to say, okay, um, what do I need to do? Well, I need to thin the, the timber stand because now there's all these real small little uh, popple trees or quaking aspen would be the another way to say that. And there are just so many. There's a, every couple of you know feet, there's a popple tree sticking there. Well, I've been going through and I've been thinning out those timber stands as I can. And it's a huge amount of work. And we're going through and we're, we're thinning out these, the timber stand. And where we've done it, we started this, doing this project a few years ago. And the areas that we've done, the trees went from just being little spindly trees to now you can't even get your hands around them. They're growing that much better because you're thinning it. See? Or should I just not care? Should I just have a house, just plunk a house down on there and just sit in, in there sipping a uh, poison pop or something and watching some Hollywood movie or whatever because the earth's going to burn up so who cares you see and you say well, I'm a, you're a Christian Brian you wouldn't watch a Hollywood movie yeah not anymore I used to back before I got saved but uh, another story but you know I could just sit around doing whatever and not care about the property but is that really what God wants Psalm 8 there David saying when I consider the heavens, the works of thy hands. He's out there. He's looking at it. You know, I listened to a thing of an older sermon by Peter Ruckman. And, um, and he said, you know, why did God make a cardinal red? You know, it just messes up evolution. I mean, how do you have a bird? The process of natural selection would have weeded out this bird that's bright red. I mean, you know, where does a cardinal fit in? They don't. Or you take a scarlet tanager or something like that. Uh, some of these birds that you see them, or a Baltimore Oriole or whatever else. I've seen all these birds. Scarlet tanager is probably one of my favorite birds. Bright red with a black with black wings. They don't fit in. Okay, it doesn't even matter if it's in in autumn when the leaves are changing colors. You can still spot them. I mean, they're like a little neon red bird that flies around and things. Absolutely beautiful birds. Uh, doesn't that go contrary to evolution? Evolution says, you know, that the bird should adapt to its surroundings. And that way they fit in this survival of the fittest, you know, that they look camouflaged, you know, so that you can't really spot them and predators can't spot them. I mean, a cardinal or a scarlet tanager or other birds like that, they don't fit in. Then why are they there? They're there for us to enjoy so that we can give praise to the Lord. Hmm. Why all the constellations up there, all the stars, which the Bible identifies as angels, by the way? What's that all about? All the beauty up there. You look up there in the night sky, the firmament showeth his handiwork, the Bible talks about. And I can see the firmament where I live. Thankfully, there's no night, you know, lamps or lights, street lights or whatever else on my property. I don't want that stuff. And so on a good clear night, I can look up, I can see the Milky Way, I can see the Big Dipper and all this other, you know, Orion, the constellations and all these names that people gave to what God created. Um, I can see it. The firmament showeth his handiwork. I can look up there and I can see all of that and say, wow, look at that. That is beautiful. But I guess I should just cover it up with uh, street lights and whatever else. Hmm. Kind of an interesting thing. No, actually, I want to see what God created. I want to help to preserve wilderness areas. Not in the sense of environmental preservation, again, where nobody can walk onto it. I'm saying keep it as it is. Don't come in here and mine this area. Don't come in here and destroy this area. And I believe that that's the right thing to do as a Christian. We should seek to worship the Lord through what He's created. Go out to his art exhibit, so to speak. Go out and consider what man or what God has made and not what man has made. Say it that way. It's kind of funny when Jesus is here on the earth, 
Uh, you can turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 12 while I'm talking here. When Jesus was here on the earth, his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Was Jesus impressed? No. The Lord's there looking out over his creation. All the bugs, all the little insects and things. I mean, you see some of the little bugs that are around. They're amazing to look at. The artwork that's in just a little bug. <coughs> a butterfly. I mean, look at butterflies. They're, they're beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Look at the little lilies, which we'll be getting to here in Luke chapter 12. Look at all the different things. And you give God glory through that. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. <clears throat> Let's read about it here. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens. What did David say? When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy hands. Are ravens the works of God's hands? Yes, they are. I actually saw a white raven the one time coming here to... The office the one morning i wanted to get a picture of it and i never did pulled over and he flew off but uh, it was amazing pure white raven consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap which neither have storehouse nor barn and god feedeth them how much more are ye better than the fowls and which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least why take ye thought for the rest Consider the lilies, how they grow, that they toil, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Do you ever pick up a flower and actually look at the flower petals and look at how fine they are, all the little ribs and things inside them, and it's amazing. Again, the beauty of a rose petal. I mean, I we have wild roses in the area up here, the pink little wild roses, and um, I've picked the petals of those. And we put them in a jar or whatever else. We'll, not in a jar right away, but we'll let them dry out. And then after they're dried out, the rose petals, put them in a jar or some other place. And you open it up a year or two later, and you can still smell that beautiful smell of roses from the dried rose petals. Can you do that with fabric? No. Why would God go to all the trouble of making something so beautiful and exquisite if he just doesn't care? And just, yeah, run over it, you know, whatever else. No, we're supposed to consider it. Why? So that we can give God glory through his creation. Verse 28. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not uh, ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, brother, I have work to do, so I don't really need to care about the environment or whatever else, what God created. Uh, no, it's not saying that. Seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, I'm living proof of that. I went into ministry years ago, not owning my own land, not owning my own place or whatever else. And, and I sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God added a lot to me. God gave me land and, and a dream property and whatever else. I'm out in nature every day. And I really appreciate that. Verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So you have to get the order correct there. You do the work of the Lord first, but part of that work is the reward of being out in nature, the reward of being there and living that healthy lifestyle of being in a natural environment that we're supposed to have dominion over, we're supposed to take care of. I think the greatest thing is to be out living in the countryside. I know a lot of my viewers live in the city and things like that. Um, okay, if that's where you're at, you get saved. Well, obviously, you don't just get transported out to the country as soon as you get saved. But uh, 
you, should, you would do well to try to get away from the cities and try to get out into the countryside someplace. Even if you have a park in the area there of where you're at in the city, go to the park. Look at some things that are natural and give God glory for it. Revelation 11, 18. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. This is an important one, which I've been over many times. Bring this up a lot, especially with what we're going into. Revelation 11, 18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward, give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Um, does God care about the earth? Yes, he does. Is he going to punish people who destroyed the earth? Yes, he will. Yes, he absolutely will. Um, that's why you need to be careful what you do with God's creation. Don't go overboard. Don't worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Uh, don't do that. Don't start to say, well, I'm going to build this special place and it's, nobody can mess with it or whatever else. Uh, all flesh is grass, brethren. Everything will perish. This world will burn one day. This isn't our home, okay? But enjoy what God has made while we're in this life. You are given dominion, right? Um, just tell you a little story here. Uh, went out to pick up my wife out in Iowa many years ago. And uh, went out there. I was staying at her parents' place. And... Um, and then we were going to travel. I was going to get my wife. I was packing up a lot of her belongings. I had rented a van. And then we were going to go from Iowa back to Pennsylvania. Her parents would fly out a few days later. And then we would have the wedding ceremony. And then they would fly back. Um, <coughs> and so we're out there in Iowa. And they said, hey, we'd like to take you two out. You know, her parents took my, you know, Catherine, my future wife, and me out to eat at a pizza place little small pizza restaurant in town there in Atlantic, Iowa. And we got done and we were, you know, they said, hey, do you want to go for a walk? There's a little park in town here, a nice little lake that, you know, a little man-made lake and whatever else. Would you like to go? Yeah, sure. And so we were there, we were walking around. And I remember her parents were in front of myself and Catherine and all of a sudden, my future father-in-law, he says, oh, he said, what, what in the world's going on? And you could hear this duck squawking and making a lot of noise down off the bank towards where the pond was. And he walks down there and this duck had a little baby duckling and the duckling had fishing line that some slob had basically cut their fishing line. It got a tangle and they cut it, pulled it out and just threw it on the bank there and then went back to fishing, I guess, again. And they just left the plastic fishing line there. And this little duckling had it all wrapped around his body and all around his legs and whatever. And the mama duck was all upset about it. And so we went down and my future father-in-law, he kind of got the mother duck off to the side. And I got the little duckling and I held the little duckling and I took all that fishing line off that little duckling. Put him in the water and he swam away and Everything's happy and nice again. That was a good thing to do. Oh, you're some kind of environmentalist, you greeny or something like this. Or my favorite is when somebody calls me a tree hugger. Yeah, that's that's a funny one. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm definitely a tree hugger. I used to log and still have my professional saw and everything else. <laughs> Forty-two inch bar, three ninety-four XP Husqvarna, but I'm a tree hugger. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I see an animal that's in trouble or something, one of God's creatures, and I can help them, absolutely I'll help them. Um, I actually, a little funny story here, the one time we were in West Virginia, down there I have relatives down in West Virginia, they moved down there, uh, my older sister and her husband, and we went down to see them, and we went back, back on this hiking trail, and there was this beautiful waterfall in this stream, there's this big, ugly, old, rotted limb sticking in this waterfall, and it just looked awful, and I thought, I should probably clear that that uh, ugly limb off of there because it would really make the waterfall look nice. <laughs> so I I'm climbing out across this rock, you know, and it was a pretty good fall down in you know, waterfall down in there, and I'm crawling out across and reaching way out to try to grab this this 
old rotted ugly log and I grabbed the thing and I started to pull it and when I did I put my foot positioned a little differently it was slippery and I went and right down into that right off the rocks down into the water down the waterfall into the big pool down there and it was up to here I remember the bottom of my beard got actually wet it was shorter back then but the bottom of my beard got wet it was that deep I'm six foot three so that deep of water it was a pretty deep pool I touched the bottom um, why why would I go to the hassle of doing that the world's going to burn brother why who cares why would you do that because I care about God's creation because I like to see a beautiful waterfall I like to see a nice bird I like to see a beautiful butterfly or little beetle or something like that that looks really neat I like to look at flowers my brother-in-law used to pick on me sometimes. We'd go out fly fishing, and I'd see some wild flower, and I'd get down, and I'd be taking pictures of it with my camera. I wonder what kind of wild flower that is. And I wonder if it's an herb of some kind. And it, Are we taking pictures of flowers, or are we going to catch fish? <laughs> I love God's creation. I do. Even before I was a saved man, even before the Lord, you know, saved me, and I started reading the Bible and, and knew the scriptures that I'm supposed to, consider the works of God's hands. Even before I knew that, I still loved nature. I played in the woods as a little boy. So, um, is it important to consider what God has made? Is it important to fight for things like, you know, hey, I don't want some stupid mind coming to the area? Yes, I, I believe it is. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get so, to the point where that's all you do. Um, we're to be fishers of men. Um, I'm very tempted a lot of times to go out and just do a lot of fishing for actual fish. But uh, it's you have to weigh that stuff out. It's fine to go fishing, just don't do it too much, is what I'm trying to say. It's fine to care about the environment, but just don't go too far with it. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all those things shall be added unto you. All right. So... Um, don't fall for this foolish philosophy of the world's going to burn, so therefore it doesn't matter. Um, there's a lot of men, especially in the Baptist churches, the, the pride of the Baptist churches, where it becomes all about money, and they just they sarcastically joke about you know this thing. I remember the the one church we were going to in Eldred, Pennsylvania. There was a family there, and uh, they had uh, fracking going on in their area of Tioga, Tioga County of Northern Pennsylvania. There was a lot of fracking going on there. And they had shale on their property. Marcella Shale went through their property. And um, there was talk about putting a well on their property. And the wife was, I don't really want it. And the husband was, you know, hey, man, if there's money in this, you know. you know. So that's that mindset's out there in the King James Bible-believing Baptist-type movement. I've seen it. Um, and if you speak against it, oh, you're a greenie, you're a tree hugger or something like this because you're saying, hey, that could mess up the environment. Oh, come on, man, it's all going to burn. Um, it will all burn, but God has plans before it burns. And he's going to be restoring the earth to a level of purity and caring about the environment, caring about what he created. So God doesn't want us to just trash things and whatever else trashes creation for money for the love of money that's the primary reason why people do trash the creation by the way um so it's an important study and uh one i've wanted to get out for a long time now um so please do take these things to heart please pray about it find ways that you can get out into nature and study what god has made if you don't live in the country uh, well, okay, go to a park or something like that, but uh, do something. Get out there and, and uh, consider the heavens. Consider the works of God's hands, how he created uh, things that are just beautiful. So that is going to be it, and uh, thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, 
we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.